You might be wondering why you're here, why the doctors have said it's important for you to attend this session. What we do know is that people who attend this session actually do better after their surgery because they're more prepared, they know what to expect, they know everything that they can do to prepare themselves for the surgery and for the treatment they're going to have and for their recovery afterwards. So um, this is the official name of what you're having, robotic assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy. We'll show you a bit in a little while a bit more about the robot, or RALP for short, so keyhole surgery. ERP stands for Enhanced Recovery Programme and that's just a fancy term for making sure you're doing all the things that you should be doing to get yourself up and about quickly after the surgery and, and back to your normal activities. We're going to hand out a patient diary for you all um, that um, we'd like you to bring into hospital with you. Um, these are used um, in conjunction with the ward staff and goes through all the things that you should be doing um, each day. Are you doing your leg exercises? Are you doing your deep breathing exercises? Have you managed to drink enough fluids? Have you been walking around? And you can carry on using it when you go home. There's space in the back to put your details of any follow-up appointments if you want to. And on the penultimate page, you'll see a thing there that says final histology. So all of you to be sat in this room will have had a biopsy of your prostate. And a biopsy is a snapshot of what's in your prostate. Once your prostate, all of it is removed, it is sent to the lab and every little bit of it is looked at under the microscope. And sometimes your Gleason score, which I'm sure you all know, can change. So when you come for your appointment four to six weeks after your surgery, that's when you'll be given your final histology and told, yes, we've, the margins were all clear, we've removed all the cancer as far as we can see, or um, you, know, you may need some more treatment in the future. We're going to teach you how to do pelvic floor exercises and we want you to start doing these exercises from today because that will help you with your continence following the surgery. So this is the surgical team and you may be wondering why you're coming here from all of your local hospitals. So uh, originally prostate removal was done at lots and lots of different hospitals but what we've realised is the people that do this operation the most are the best at it. So, so, special, so services have been specialised and centralised. They're part of a quality assurance programme. It's quite unique so that all of their outcomes are very carefully monitored so we know they're all as good as each other and they do this surgery day in and day out. And this is the largest centre in the UK for, for doing this surgery. And along with those, that team are all these other people behind the scenes who you may and may not see, um, who are a bit like a Formula One team and you're the car. So um, all of us are here to, to help you and to try and make you have the best experience possible during your treatment and follow up here. The robot comes in three pieces. So the surgeon sits here in the console, he operates the robot, but he doesn't actually have to touch you, all right? The regis and myself, so the other training uh, registrars, and myself are actually the ones that actually put the ports into you. So we are the ones that put the holes in you, not the surgeon, all right? So as I said, she comes in three bits. This is where I stand, or one of the registrars, um, when we operate. So I use a system, which is here, the stack system, okay? Now that's 2D, two-dimensional. So the bits that I use are like operating with chopsticks. It's like this, yeah? Whereas the bits that the surgeon uses, so that bit, the really expensive bit, it's really precise. The movement is actually better than the human hand, okay? And it's quite small, isn't it? The tip of it, here, yeah? Because we're all sitting on your prostate. So it's quite a narrow space we're operating in. So we need all the help we can get. So essentially, your legs are gonna be put into stirrups. We tilt the table, so your head's down here and your feet are up here, okay? So that's the position you'll be in. And one of the good things about robotic surgery is how we can see, okay? When the surgeon puts his head into here, he actually feels like he's inside you. It's that precise, okay? The camera that we use is a special camera. It's got a left eye and a right eye. Like your brain has a left eye and a right eye, it converts the image to a 3D image, okay? So that's why it's quite precise. So diet, a high carbohydrate diet. So all the things that people tell you not to have a lot of, I want you to have a little bit more just two days before surgery, okay? 
So essentially, what we're trying to do is that enhanced recovery Karen was talking about. You're going to be fasted for a period of time, okay? I need to make sure you've got enough energy reserves in you to last you through that period. So that's why we're preloading you before. So essentially, the carbohydrates, they will change into sugar, they'll convert into sugar, and it'll be stored. So during that fasting period, the body reconverts it, and you've got energy, okay? You're only allowed one high energy drink, okay? And that's the night before surgery. I'd rather you not have any drink with too much caffeine in it. So for the people that are diabetic, no high energy drink for you. So post-operatively, lots of high sources of protein. Your body needs to start repairing itself. In order for it to repair itself, it needs protein. Is there anybody who's vegetarian? Yes, so because you don't, you, you don't eat meat, obviously, you need to have stuff that's high in protein. So legumes, okay? Soya, really good. So high vitamins, so fresh fruits and vegetables, especially green leafy vegetables, something that has lots of iron in it, okay? Because you're going to have some sort of blood loss, but it's not going to be enough for us to replace it, okay? So day zero, this is your update. This is the day you're coming in to surgery, okay? So you'll be nil by mouth. That means you would have not had anything to eat and drink, all right? When you go to pre-assessment, they will give you specific instructions to the times that you're coming in for surgery. But pre-assessment will tell you when to stop eating and drinking. So medication, if you're on regular medication, please take it unless you've been specifically told not to. If you're on medication that pre-assessment has told you to stop, you need to stop it. If you're on blood thinners, you will need to stop that as well. So have a wash, okay? It doesn't have to be antiseptic or anything like that, just a regular wash. Please do not help me by shaving. So I will shave you from just below your nipples to the top of your pubis, okay? It's gonna be quite a big square, I'm afraid. I will also shave a square patch on your thigh that's because we use diathermy to seal blood vessels, so electricity. It's just a, a grounding, essentially. Once you come in, you will come into surgical reception on the second floor. So once you come to surgical reception, you'll get a gown and you'll get some really sexy stockings. They're really difficult to put on. They will show you how to put them on, okay? And I'm afraid you're going to have to keep these on, okay, when you go home. Because essentially what, it's what we're trying to do is to prevent you from getting a deep vein thrombosis, okay, or a blood clot. It, what the gown you get, it ties at the back, I'm afraid, right? We will give you another gown to keep your dignity. You will also see the doctors, right? The surgeon will go through with you, your consent form. You will also see the anaesthetist. So from surgical reception, you will come to the anaesthetic bay. That's where you'll be put to sleep. And then from the anaesthetic bay, you will come into theatre. So in theatre, we take about 20 minutes to position you. And because the robot's going to be attached to you, okay, it's called what we call docking. So I need to make sure that you, you all stay in the same position for that two and a half hours. Okay? So it does take time. Remember the question you asked me? How long does it take? The operation itself, yes, will probably last about an hour and a half, two and a half hours. But you will be missing for about five hours. Okay? Everything we do takes time. So that's why we say, okay, you know, if your loved ones are here, I would probably just pop to the shops. As soon as the surgeon's finished operating and I'm stitching you up, he will call you, okay, to tell you everything's gone well, okay? So once you leave theater, you will go to recovery. Now, recovery, everybody's a little slightly different. Some people will take an hour, an hour and a half to recover. It just depends on how quickly the gases come out of you, okay? When you're in that position, head down, Everything goes to your face, okay? So you get a little bit puffy. But when we sit you the right side up, it will dissipate, but essentially, you know, your eyes get a little bit itchy with that. So that's why, so especially people with glasses, um, they probably won't give it back to you straight away. So from recovery, you'll go to the ward, okay? So when you wake up, you will have a drip. The reason why we do that is because you've stopped drinking, haven't you? We need to keep you hydrated. So that's why we have that drip. As soon as you start eating and drinking normally, that comes down, okay? You will be on oxygen for a little bit. That gets rid of the anesthetic gases out of you faster, all right? They usually administer this with a mask. You will have a catheter, gentlemen. There is no if, ands, or buts about that. It'll be your best friend for two weeks. You may have a drain. It just depends on your surgery. 
before we go into your surgery, we plan your surgery, okay? If the surgeon hasn't mentioned to you that you're having lymph nodes taken out, then that means you don't need to have them taken out. This is what a drain looks like. The reason why we put a drain is, with your lymph nodes, if you've had that done, it just gets rid of the excess fluid. That's all it's doing, okay? And this is how long it is, okay? Curls round in your tummy and it's taken out the next day before you go home. It goes in through one of the ports that's already there. Pain relief. You will wake up feeling really comfortable, okay? We do something called a tap block before surgery, so you will wake up feeling very comfortable because it's a block that will numb you all the way around here. The anaesthetist is gonna give you really strong painkillers as well. So when you wake up, you might feel, oh, okay, I might feel a little bit bloated, but actually I'm okay, all right? Don't expect to feel like you've had nothing done. That is unrealistic. You've come in for surgery, okay? So discomfort is the word I would like to use. If you're in discomfort, I accept that. Pain, another connotation. If you're in pain, you need to let us know. We will give you something for it, okay? So four to six hours after this operation, I expect you to be sitting out in bed, yeah? So if you're done at seven in the morning and you're back on the ward, I expect you to be sitting out for supper, okay? If you're done last on the list, and you come back to the ward about eight o'clock, you can have a lie-in. Simple movement. All I'm asking you to do is move from the bed to the chair. I'm not asking you to run around the ward, but I need you to get moving. Because remember, you're in hospital for one night. So I need to make sure that actually you can function when you go home. So simple things, so just start to walk. Everything you've got is mobile. That drain, that drip, okay, the catheter, they can go with you, okay? Have a wash. You can put your own clothes on, yeah. Put your own pajamas on, it'll make you feel a lot better. You will have a blood test before discharge. And the reason why we, try and we need to have that blood test is to make sure everything's gone, kind of gone back to normal, okay? You need to prepare to go home, all right? That's what the enhanced recovery is about, because you're in hospital for one night, okay? So eating and drinking, you have to wait at least four hours after surgery. I wouldn't start with a curry though, I would start with a cup of tea, okay? Because essentially, what we want to do is just kind of little and often, all right? You remember, you've had major surgery. We've put there constipation is your enemy because you will be a little bit constipated. We know this. This is one of the side effects of the surgery, all right? And the reason why that happens is for a number of reasons. One, you've had really strong painkillers, okay? Those painkillers are opiates. They slow down the gut motility, okay? So it doesn't move as swiftly as it should do. Also, if your bowel is in the way, I'm going to move it aside. The minute you touch the bowel, it goes on strike. It says you've touched me and I will not move, okay? So it's kind of one of those things, we know it's gonna to happen to you. So the next day on the ward round, when we ask you, have you passed wind? It's because once you've started to pass wind, it's because your bowels have started to work, <coughs> yeah? It is unrealistic for, us to, uh, for, you, for you to pass to open your bowels in, th in hospital, okay? It's not gonna happen. So we, you generally expect people to have their bowels open within two or three days after, okay? We will give you something for it. It's something called Movicol, okay? It's a softener, it's not a mover, okay? Now, if you get to day three and you think, really uncomfortable, I would keep on hand something called, something like Senecot, something like that, okay, where you will get a movement with it, all right? Things to start thinking about now is how you're gonna get home, um, because it's gonna be less than 24 hours since you've had major surgery, so we really don't want you going home on public transport, up and down stairs, on buses and things where there's lots of bugs and things. Get someone, a friend who can come and pick you up, or pre-book a local cab. Um, there is a free phone taxi number in the outpatients that you can call. Parking around here is a nightmare, um, but there are two um, pick-up drop-off spaces just outside the front of the hospital. So they're 20 minutes and we've got a discharge lounge. So when you come in the main hospital doors at the front, it's the first door on your right, you probably didn't see it, and it's got comfy chairs and a TV and there's a nurse always in there. And they can take you and your belongings down there and then someone can just park up and come in and get you. Um, it says there is someone going to be at home. You don't necessarily need somebody at home with you. Just make sure you've got anything heavy shopping and things like that in already. And uh, maybe arrange for someone just to call you every day just to make sure that you're all right. Um, it says there, where do you live? I'm sure you all know where, you're, where you live. 
Um, but it's just things like if you live on the 16th floor and the lift breaks, you're probably not going to be able to get up 16 floors. Um, you'll be fine going up, a few, up and down a few flights of stairs, but just if you live very high, things to start thinking about now. Bring some comfy clothes with you. So jeans are probably the worst thing. Where the waistband is, is where your wounds are. So get some jogging bottoms, tracksuit bottoms, something like that. Um, the other thing is when you're going home, you might want to bring a little cushion or a little pillow just to put it underneath the seatbelt because where the seatbelt's going to go, it might just rub onto those wounds where they are on your tummy. Anna's already mentioned you'll be sent home with some laxatives called Movacol. Um, you'll also be sent home with some painkillers, paracetamol, ibuprofen and cocodamol, as long as you're okay to take them. Um, you can take the paracetamol and the ibuprofen together. They work differently in different pathways in the body. Don't take the paracetamol and the cocodamol together because they've both got paracetamol in them. Cocodamol are a bit stronger and so some people just take them at night for the first few days when they go home just to help them get off to sleep. But try not to take them too much because cocodamol have got codeine in them and codeine makes you constipated and we've already said we don't want you to get constipated. LMWH stands for low molecular weight heparin. So as well as having your socks on to stop you getting a blood clot, you're going to have to have an injection one a day for the first 28 days to stop you being at risk of getting a blood clot. The nurses on the ward will show you before you go home how to do it. We advise you do it in your thigh. So one day left leg, one day right leg. You'll be sent home with 28 injections or 27 or 26 if you've had one or two in the hospital. It's like this, it's a tiny needle, much smaller than even an insulin injection that people give. You don't have to draw anything up. It's a pre-filled syringe. You don't have to start flicking like you see us nurses doing all the time. You just take the cap off, pinch the skin a bit and put it in your thigh. You're not trying to find a vein. You're not trying to go under into the muscle. It's just under the skin. Please don't put the needles in the rubbish because we don't want any needles in the general rubbish. You'll be given one of these, which, which is a sharp spin. When you've done the injection, put it in the sharp spin. When you've finished all of the injections, close it up. You're coming here anyway four to six weeks after. We're more than happy to take them, or you can take them to your GP or pharmacy. Um, BYO stands for bring your own. So whatever medication you're on, just bring a few days supply of it in. It'll be just put in the little locker by your bed. Um, and it'll be given to you again before you go home. It's just easier than trying to get all the medication from the pharmacy. Say so bring about three days of your own medication in with you. So this was traditionally how we used to do the operation, a big cut. And now you will have six little holes here, ports. Your prostate will be removed from the one just above your belly button. So the prostate is put into a little bag inside you and taken out whole. If your prostate's a bit larger, they might have to just make that cut a little bit bigger to get your prostate out. When you go home, you won't have a dressing or anything like that to change. You've just got dissolvable sutures inside here and around each one will be a square patch of white glue. It's completely waterproof. You can go in the shower or the bath. We'd advise you to have a shower. But if you haven't got one, a bath is fine, just don't stay in it for too long. So every day to have a shower just to keep those wounds clean. And gradually, after about three weeks, the sutures will start to dissolve and the white film around there will just shed naturally as your skin sheds. If a corner of it starts to come unstuck, don't pick, it, pick at it, just get some nail scissors and just trim it. As Anna said, discomfort, not pain. You can sometimes get a bit of bruising around these. That's nothing to worry about at all. It will all settle down. For those of you that have not had a catheter, a catheter is a tube that goes through the penis into the bladder and drains urine. This is put in when you're asleep, so you don't need to worry about that. It's taken out when you're awake, though. It takes a few seconds to be removed, yeah? Just an odd sensation, two or three seconds. So a catheter's put in, and it stays in by a balloon like this, filled with water, I've just done it with air, um, to stop it falling out when you stand up. When it's removed, the balloon is deflated and the catheter is removed. The catheter will be attached to a bag, called a leg bag, like this, when you go home. So um, a lot, you can get a short tube leg bag, so it's on your thigh, but a lot of men prefer the one which is on your calf down here. 
So there's a few reasons why you need a catheter. So this is your prostate here, and it's going to be removed. Your prostate surrounds the top bit of your water pipe. So we've taken that bit out, and we've stitched the two ends together. If urine is coming down the water pipe where the stitches are, then it's not going to heal up. So we need to make sure there's no urine coming down it. So that's one of the reasons why you need a catheter. The second reason is that ordinarily our bladders fill up and we go to the toilet for a wee. When you've got a catheter, as soon as any urine drains down from your kidneys into your bladder, it drains down the little holes here and into the bag. So it's not like a sudden gush into the bag, it's just a gradual, gentle trickle into the bag. Because if your bladder were to fill up, as it normally does, that would put pressure on these stitches and again, they wouldn't heal properly. And the third reason you need a catheter is that if we removed this here and just left it, your water pipe would just close up and you wouldn't be able to pee at all. So while the catheter's in, it acts like a stent just to keep that bit of your water pipe open. So that's why everybody has to have a catheter in. It's really important. So you will get one of these, which is a leg bag. It's got two Velcro straps, one at the top and one at the bottom, that fasten around your leg on the inside of your trousers, so nobody would be able to see it's there. Once it gets half, three quarters full, you'll feel it get a bit heavy on your leg. You need to empty it down the toilet. Whatever you're doing with your catheter, you always need to make sure that you wash your hands before and afterwards. You don't need to wear gloves. You're not going to give yourself any bugs. So you just open the tap, empty it down the toilet. Once it's empty, remember to close the tap. So this holds 500 mils and you might pass more than that at night time. So you'll be given a night bag, which is one of these, which holds two litres. Not many men would pass two litres in a night. And <clears throat> you would just take the cap off, put the, attach the night bag to the bottom when you go to bed, open the tap and it will drain down into the overnight bag. Have that maybe in a little bucket or something like that, a little bag next to you on the floor next to your bed. Just make sure it's below the level of your bladder. And then in the morning when you get up, remember to close the tap and disconnect it and then rinse this through with soap and water. And it's got, that's got a tap on the bottom as well. Each bag lasts for a week and you'll be given spare bags to go home with you. Um, a few things to remember, you can go in the shower with it, don't, you don't disconnect it or anything like that. You can get a bit of crustiness at the end of the penis, which is a bit of mucus that you normally pee out. If that happens, just get a cotton wool and some water or a wipe and just make sure you're wiping away from your body, not towards you, so any bugs are being wiped away from you. With regards to blockage, this is very, very unlikely to happen, but we have to tell you about it. If you think the catheter's blocked and it's not draining, if there's nothing coming into the bag, first of all, make sure that the tubing's not kinked, that you're not sat on it or something like that. Have a drink, have a walk around. If you think, actually, my bladder's starting to fill up, it's not draining, it could be that the little holes at the end have got a bit blocked. You need to go to your local A&E department where they'll get one of these, which is a bladder syringe, and they'll push some saline through and just clear that blockage. Don't think, I'll go to bed and see what it's like in the morning. This is an emergency. It's unlikely to happen, but we have to warn you about it um, because literally it takes a couple of minutes to clear it. If you notice that your urine is suddenly very smelly or it's gone very red, then it can be a sign that you've got an infection, in which case you need to go to your doctors and say, I need a prescription. Again, unlikely to happen, but it's just something to be aware of. If the catheter falls out, you need to just call us and let us know. It'll be just that that balloon's popped. If it's three days after the surgery, we're likely to say, you need to come back here. <coughs> if it's 10 days after, we're probably gonna say, you'll be fine. And the catheter is removed here at Westmoreland Street and you'll get that appointment to come back about two weeks after the surgery for the catheter to be removed. So TWOC stands for trial without catheter. There is a trial going on at the moment where they're um, doing trying the catheter removal after seven days. Um, the doctors will decide during the surgery whether they want to put you down for that. There's nothing that you can do or can't do. If you do have the catheter removed after a week, you will need what's called a cystogram which is where some dye is pushed through the catheter 
um, and they take an x-ray to make sure the dye's going where it should be um, to make sure everything's healed up. Continence, um, we are going to talk to you about pelvic floor exercises. There is an app that can help you with your pelvic floor exercises, an NHS app called Squeezy. And quite a lot of our men have uh, found it useful for them getting on track with their exercises. And with regards to pads, don't go out and buy loads of expensive pads. You will be given some pads when you go home and also when you go home after the catheter is removed. These are men's pads. There's all different makes of them and you um, take the sticky off, stick it to the front of your pants, like this, um, and they, they can, they're quite, quite good for people when they are leaking a little bit. Um, best to wear more fitted uh, under, underpants, something that's a bit more supportive. So you'll get a phone call a week after your surgery from our support worker, Bernadette, to see how you're doing and to make sure you've got that appointment for the catheter removal. And then a week or two after that, you'll get an appointment, which will be a phone call with one of our continence team to see how you're doing with your waterworks and to give you some advice about that as well. So we will be carefully monitoring you and giving you advice at all points throughout this. A lot of men don't realise they have a pelvic floor. It's because you've never had to use it. You're going to have to start now. I teach this really simply. So if we sit back in the chairs, OK, excellent. <laughs> You're gonna have to use your imagination a little bit. Yeah, all right. So you're in a lift, yes? This lift is full. You need to pass wind. It's not socially appropriate at that point in time to let rip, okay? So that muscle that you're squeezing to hold that wind in, I need you to find it for me. So you just need to squeeze and hold, okay? Just initially for three seconds and then let it go. So you're trying to do that 10 times, okay? And then we wait, let the muscles oxygenate themselves again. We do it 10 times again, and then we wait, and then 10 times again. So essentially in that period of time, you're doing it for 30 times, okay? You need to do this five times for the day. So I'm asking you to do this 150 times for the day. Because essentially what's happening, so that's your water pipe, yeah? It's like a man in a life raft at the minute, yeah? What we need to do is do the exercises so it bulks the muscle up. When you go to the gym, it takes repetition. So you need to bulk it up so it helps you from the underneath, okay? Because your pelvic floor is not one muscle. It's a group of muscles that are interlinked, okay? And it runs from all the way from the back to the front, okay? So we, when you're doing it, it's the whole, all the muscle groups that you're doing, not just one, okay? Second exercise, all right? So you're standing there having a wee. I need you to try and stop your wee. So that muscle that we use to stop your wee, I need you to try and find it for me. But that one's a fast one. That one starts, stop, starts, stop, okay? Again, 10 times. We wait 10 times again, we wait 10 times again. So we're only doing this 10 times by three, okay? Five times for the day, yeah. It's a lot of exercises, all right? But you need to do your part. It's a two-way street, okay? We can't just do all the work. You need to be part of it as well, okay? Because it's your care. At the beginning, you probably won't notice if you're doing it correctly. Because when you're starting to do it, you're probably thinking, actually, everything's moving together. That's what it's supposed to feel like, all right? Because they're all interlinked. Now, I'd like you to do these exercises sitting, standing, and lying. Because your pelvic floor is fluid, because you're moving, yes? So as you're moving, your pelvic floor will move. One exercise is for strength, and the other one is for stamina. Okay, so essentially, one you're gonna need to hold and walk to the toilet, and the other one is your emergency break. Okay, so when you cough or sneeze, that's the one you need, all right? If you think, oh, I'm really not sure what she's saying. I'm not seeing it, I can't visualize it. Stand in front of a mirror, strip down, okay? Start to do the exercises. You will see the tip of the penis move. Okay, it's not gonna be a big movement. And when you do see that movement, you're doing it correctly. Okay, so exercise daily. I don't mean run five miles. 
all I want you to do is get out the house, okay? If you have a dog, walk it. If you don't have one, go and buy the newspaper. But I need you out the house every day, okay? Every day, a little at a time. I need you moving. No cycling for three months. So if you do exercise at the gym, take a pass on that. No driving while the catheter is in, okay? Because it will invalidate your insurance, okay? No lifting for six weeks after this, okay? Because you're at risk, if you lift too soon, you're at risk of getting what we call a port side hernia. So work, we recommend six weeks off, but you need to listen to your body, all right? Listen to your body. If you need a sick note, just let the nurses know on the ward and they will send, and the doctors will sign it and get you. And the GP, if you need, will extend it. So nerve sparing, this is discussed with your surgeon. If we can spare your nerves, we will try to spare your nerves. We are doing this operation to cure your cancer. We will do our best, okay? Now the nerves that supply your erections are not like the nerves on your hand. You can say, yep, that's a nerve, let's avoid it. It's not like that. You know when you peel an onion, that fine gossamer layer that you see, that's what the nerves look like, okay? It's a network, okay? Your prostate sits in the middle and it curves around the prostate. Now, if we can spare your nerves, we will. However, if your cancer is quite close to the edge of the prostate, I'm afraid we're gonna have to take those nerves. Because with cancer operations, we take the next thing next to it. Because that's the most likely of place where it will spread. If, however, it's on the inside, we will spare those nerves. Sometimes we do what we call an incremental spare. So we will start off a little bit wide where we will take the nerves on this side. And then as we go up, we will spare the nerves on the top. It is dependent on where your cancer is. Even if you've had nerve sparing surgery, don't expect things to work straight away, okay? Because nerves don't like electricity and they don't like movement. We have to use both those things to take your prostate out. It will get better as time goes on, all right? However, sometimes you need to give it a little bit of help. So, there's tablets for that, okay? So it's either Cialis, uh, Viagra, or Levitra, okay? <coughs> now, some of those things are coming off license, so the GP will probably give you something that's generic, okay? It will work if their nerve's there, but sometimes you might have to take a couple of doses, right? Some people will say, if you've got no nerves, there's no point taking it. We always say try and take it because what it does do, it encourages blood flow to the area, okay? One of the things as well after this operation, you will no, no longer have that normal ebb and flow you would normally have, okay? Because the erections aren't there, yeah? So you're not getting that nocturnal erections that you normally have, okay? So you have about nine or 10 a night that you don't know about. That's keeping the tissues healthy. That's why we kind of want you, to, it's operating on a cellular level, okay? It mightn't do anything in the beginning, but cellularly, it's helping. Now, if we've tried it and you think, okay, that's not helped, there are other things, okay? This is called Muse Alprostadil, okay? This goes down the tip of the water pipe, all right? This is called Viridal Duo, okay? And that's an injection. Most people will try it tablets first, then muse as it goes down the water pipe, and then the injection, okay? Now, this is a pump. I recommend this to every patient, okay? Whether or not you've had nerve sparing surgery, and the reason why we say that, it encourages blood flow to the area, okay? You can use it for intercourse if you so choose, but the reason why we recommend it for everybody from the beginning is just to make sure you keep your length. This is kind of the Rolls Royce, of, of all of that. It's called an implant. This is probably one of the biggest centers um, in the UK to put these in. Now, this operation to do that, it is major surgery, okay? You can't say, I wanna go straight to that. That's not how it works. You have to try all of these first before you go to that, all right? Because essentially, you're changing your anatomy. We try for the least invasive before you go to the most invasive. So the point of this slide really is to kind of let you know, let's cure the cancer and then we'll try and help you fix it. Okay, so follow up. One week after the surgery, oh, Bernadette will call you. She'll ask you kind of like a list of questions to see how you're doing. 
but if you're concerned about anything just let us know in your pack that you have you have our details on it please use it okay four to six weeks after the surgery you're coming back here all right and that's where we will let you know what we found and what's the next port of call is okay for everybody in this room we would like to think we can offer you PSA surveillance but we don't know obviously until we take it out okay but we will try so three monthly PSA so your first PSA is usually done here um, at three months and we will make sure that your continence is assessed your erectile function is assessed and all of that before sending you back to your referring hospitals okay uh, there will be somebody like myself or Karen at your referring hospital and that they're the ones who will kind of take over your care once you leave us. Support groups. There is a support group here. Uh, it's run on a Thursday, um, second Thursday every month. All right. Everybody's journey is slightly different. And it's nice to kind of go and say, well, actually, I did this. This is happening to me. I did this. So it's just a way to exchange ideas. As well as in your pack, there is a list of support groups that are local to you. So utilize what's there. Macmillan, as well as prostate cancer, they have a buddying system. So if you think, actually, I need more information, you can call up and say, I'd like to meet somebody or speak to somebody who's been through this before. And that person is quite happy to share their story. OK, so the key messages from this, plan and prepare for surgery. OK, you're having an operation. You will get a date for surgery. Plan and prepare for it. The injections, all right, we have to remember to do them once a day. OK, catheter care. And constipation, what to do for it, okay, and what to expect. Pelvic floor exercises, please do them. It's your care, you have to take charge of it, okay. So follow up, as I said, um, what to expect, and keep active, okay. You don't have to go to the gym, just walk. Keep drinking one and a half to two liters of water every day. It can be tea or coffee, but watch the caffeine. I know it's a lot of do's and don'ts, but it's only for that recovery period, okay? Excellent.